Welcome to the Billy Wilder Theater. I'm Claudia Bester. I'm the Director of Public Programs, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to tonight's talk by Note Vital. Note Vital was born in Sent, which is a village in the lower Engadin region of Switzerland. He trained as an artist both in Paris and Rome, which was the beginning of decades of wanderlust and travel to places that most of us only dream of. Currently, Vital divides his time between studios in Sent, in Beijing, and Agadez, Niger, as well as Patagonia in Chile. His past and current projects include a sculpture park in his home village of Sent, a series of buildings as sculptures in Agadez, and the island of Notona in Patagonia. A lifetime of traversing the globe, a lifetime of traversing the globe, constantly engaging with local cultures and makers, has made an indelible mark on his practice. An endless curiosity for engagement with new experiences, places, and people remains at the heart of Vital's work. So please join me in welcoming the one and only Note Vital. Yeah, uh, Note Vital is my name, and please don't pronounce it not vital. I'm not out of function yet. Not is a common Romance name, and Romance is the fourth national language in Switzerland. It's spoken by less than 40,000 people in the eastern part of, uh, of Switzerland. Uh, the roots of the language are Latin, actually, vulgar Latin to be exact, but uh, I don't want to talk about languages. Um, what I want to do is to share with you a dream that I had, a great passion of mine, which I have had ever since I can remember. I was uh, born and grew up in this uh, Engadin Valley in Switzerland. You probably heard of it or maybe have even been to St. Moritz. It's famous for its beauty and attracts since generations many people like Nietzsche, uh, Boys, Hitchcock, Karajan was there and Brigitte Bardot. I went to school in the little village of Saint and school consisted of five month vacation, which was a dream for a child. And during these long summer periods from April till uh, October, uh, we, uh, my main occupation and that of my friends was building huts, was building houses in the woods with materials found but mostly just stolen in the village. The constructions needed to be quite sophisticated, uh, also in their simplicity, because uh, the climate in the Engadin is very harsh. Winters also last about five months, and if you wanted to spend nights in the trees, the huts needed to be quite well built. Later, when I read Il Barone Rampanti, The Bairn on the Trees, by the it great Italian writer Italo Calvino, it seemed to me that I somehow had been through that already. But as a grown-up, you tend to forget these important moments in life. You might still realize dreams, build houses, uh, but not with the same passion you did when you were a child. Because building permissions and restrictions and loans can easily spoil the pleasure and your dream. Luckily, I was able to embrace those passionate moments again when I went to the Sahara Desert in Niger. Niger is a, a country situated north of Nigeria, south of, of Libya. It's twice the size of France and uh, with a small population of only 10 million because most of it is desert. I went straight to a town called Agadez, over 600 miles away from the capital of Niamey. I didn't know much about this country, but because I've been traveling since my youth, uh, nomadic people attract me, and in Niger there are two tribes. Uh, one are the Tuaregs, and the other ones are the Bororo. I arrived there late at night, at the end of November 1999, and went to the only hotel at the time, which was called Hotel de Lair. Like most Africans, I rose early in the morning at dawn, left the hotel, and walked straight into a bazaar 
which was installed at the entrance door early that morning. The Tuaregs are fast, and they knew that a white man has arrived and wanted to make some business selling what they're famous for, their silver jewelry. I told them in French that I was not interested in buying silver jewelry at 6 o'clock in the morning, but uh, in, in purchasing a piece of land where I could build a house. I didn't want to waste time. Pas de problème was their quick answer. And uh, they led me to the outskirts of Agadez, in the southern part of the town. One man walking on, crutch, one on, on crutches, drawing a crooked line in the sand. They saw immediately in my eyes that this place was right. And uh, so they called the owner of the land a man with broken eyeglasses. The price was right, and uh, we closed the deal around 9 a.m. In the meantime, <coughs> I made a small drawing in my book, in my uh, notebook of how I wanted my new house to look like on this new land that I just got. Two hours later, I saw five men uh, approaching with shovels, picks, white teeth, and shiny eyes. I showed them my drawing, but they simply ignored it. It was useless to them because uh, they don't read or draw. So I threw my drawing away and traced the outlines of the house directly in the sand with my feet. And then five men began to work. I made a small model of earth and dung and showed them. They were actually astonished to see that my house would have three floors because no house in Agdez succeeds two. But they didn't complain, never used the word problem because they know what the problem is. That's why they don't use too much. And on the contrary, they seem to love the challenge. This house grew very fast, and uh, as more and more men arrived, clay was brought in from the outskirts of town on a windowless truck. Uh, sand, of course, that you can find every day, everywhere, and straw and dung was uh, that came from the camel market, of course, was mixed with wa water by dancing barefooted men, their legs so thin. Rows of bricks were laid out in the sun to dry, and they were about one by two feet. The first house that you can see here was finished by the end of that year uh, with a large room of about 50 by 50 feet and 16 feet tall and uh, holding up the bedroom, which has four doors on each direction, and a small room on top where you can see the whole city, but also the airport where flights arrive to once a week and leave once a week from Paris. The house is 42 feet tall. I measured it only after the house was already finished because there was no measuring tape when we started. Next to the house, I added seven rooms for my friends when they arrive. I wanted to share my Saharan dream with them, but for years no one came. So I used them for myself, and I spent every night of the week in a different room. You can see cow horns all around uh, these walls. The reason is simply because like, the slaughterhouse is an open space in the center of town, and uh, every part of the animal is used, but the horns, so they burn them. And the smell is so intense that I decided to have a boy collect them every morning, bring, the, bring them back to the house, and put them uh, around the walls. And so the house is simply called Mikafoni, which is in, in Tamashek, that's the language of the Tuaregs, the house of horns. I didn't know at that time that the workers wouldn't leave when the house was finished. They just stayed on to took care of the house, very much like a newborn who needs, needs care, uh, especially after the rains, when the, when the new skin or layer of mud has to be applied on the surface. And of course, if they would leave, they might be out of work. Since Agedes is the furthest city away from Niamey, 
And Niamey is the capital, as I said before, of Niger. And Niger is among the poorest countries in the world. You can, you can imagine what the local school looked like. The simplest way to describe it would be a hole in the earth filled with children. So I decided to build a new school on the land right next to the Mekafoni. There are so many kids that a lot of sitting places were needed, so I decided to build this kind of pyramid that allows all students to sit on top of it. So the students don't only go to school, but they also go on top of it. At the beginning, there were about 150 students, and both young and old, girls and boys, and they covered a quarter of the school building. But since the school is on a hill and has nice views and is windy and cool, it attracted over the years four times as many kids, so now you don't see the schoolhouse anymore. It's uh, completely covered with, with children. It's kind of a human kinetic sculpture that sings, cries, shouts, and prays. It is a very touching sight to watch this daily activi activity unfold in front of you. The inside of the school is, uh, can be used to sleep or, or to cover from the rain or heat. The school is called uh, Makaranta. You'd be completely wrong to think that I'm, a, uh, um, that I'm a man on a mission who goes to Africa to help. I'm not. But I do believe that our activities, also as an artist, uh, and also our duty, is to be engaged and pay more attention to the third world. Since the 90s, I've always been involved in projects like building a burn unit in Kathmandu, out, outside of Kathmandu, in a city called uh, Bhaktapur. And since I'm not an industrialist, I subsidize these projects with my artwork. Not being a trained architect, it gives me great satisfaction to construct a school building. I could not even dream of building a school in Europe or here in the United States uh, with all the regulations needed. But in Agadez, I can. It, give, it gives both me and the children great pleasure. In most places in the world that I know, this opportuni opportunity would be refused to me. Nietzsche once said that friendship has more to do with taking than giving. So I take this opportunity, and so do the children. After I had finished these this, uh, buildings, the 55 workers wanted more work, of course, and uh, since I uh, love to build, I purchased, uh, purchased an oasis about three miles north of the city of Agadez, uh, in a place called Kuri. The river, uh, which is called Kuri, I've never seen a drop of water in it. It's kind of like an ephemeral river. It only carries water during the rainy season and that's the time which is much too hot for me to go there because it reaches the temperatures reach far over 100 degrees and I will just burn in the sun. Uh, this is the house to watch the moon and the sky. It's a solid construction of mud, uh, 21 feet in height. You can reach only the, to the top from this outside ladder, as you can see here. And it requires a bit of concentration and skill to not only to climb it, but also to sit on top of this, or to lay on top of it. The space on top I is very narrow, and so you, you increase somehow your concentration to, to view the night skies. I remember in my loft in New York, I slept for years under sculpture which hang over my head. It was held up only by a small nail, and, uh, but I felt like my sleep was somehow intensified. I tell my friends in Europe and in the United States about this experience and me spending hours every, every, every evening on top of this house alone to look at the skies and the millions of stars, and they look at me like I'm kind of an idiot. The next uh, building is called the house against sandstorms and heat. This is 42 feet high also, and for some reason all these houses are either 42 feet or, uh, or half of it, even without measuring. It has a narrow but high uh, entrance, and on the top an opening as big as a, a big egg, a just enough to let the hot air escape, but to prevent sand to come in. 
even in the winter months, a temperature can reach over almost 100 degrees. And so uh, I needed to build a house to, to, be, to escape the heat, and it works. The metal rods that you see sticking out in all directions are both for, for, for leaning and attaching ladders when you need to, to, to apply a new uh, skin or a new layer of mud in the house after the rains, but also for decoration. Every year I, I go there, I, put, I stick something different in them. Here you can see brooms sticking out, as they would be cleaning the air when the wind blows sand with extreme speed through the desert. Any of you who have visited Africa will know very well the intensity and the speed of the sun setting. In no time, the desert turns dark. And I didn't want to, uh, to miss this daily spec spectacle. spectacle. Uh, sometimes you seem almost to hear the sunset, they're so intense. But since I'm in an oasis surrounded by, surrounded by palm trees, I had to build a high tower from which I could have a frontal view of the spectacle. So I built a tower, but this time on four floors. In the entire country of Niger, and maybe in all of West Africa, uh, there are no, no houses on four floors which are simply made, solely made of mud. And while I was explaining this house to the workers, it caused a tremendous excitement, you can imagine. Everyone had su suggestions, and, uh, but there is no engineer in Agadez to be consulted. They called me names like Noti la perdu se chèvre, meaning he lost his goats, meaning he's, he's going crazy. <coughs> but like, again, a small model was made and, uh, and work began. The four rooms that you see, are measure only 10 by 10 by 10 uh, feet, just big enough for a chair, for a table, and for a bed. The first floor doesn't have any windows. It only has a door. That's where the kitchen is, and that's where food is stored. The second has one door, one window. The third, one door, two windows. And the last one, one door and three windows. To hold up this whole, uh, whole tower, three large stairs has, uh, were built on the outside, leading up, to leading up to each room and each floor. And, and each floor can only be reached through the outside stairs, so uh, it provides each room also with privacy. The building measures, again, 42 feet. The big stairs leading to the west, where the sun sets, has 39 steps and has more than 55,000 bricks that were sun-dried on site. When the house was finished, and I spent the first night in it, after seeing the sun setting over the desert, I couldn't sleep. The emotions were too intense. If the house would have collapsed a few days later, I would not have been dev devastated. Even if it was to spend a single night in this tower, it would have made sense to build it. I invited some of my artist friends uh, to this oasis. Uh, one is Richard Long. Uh, and when sitting on the steps watching the sunset, he presented me with a sculpture of the sun. It's a concentric, it's made of concentric bricks. Uh, and it, it's the biggest sculpture he ever made. It's like a uh, hundred feet in diameter. I only realized the purity of this building when the tower was built. No elements, not even a single brick, needs to be removed or added. It's in, in itself, it's pure. That's when I decided to build one of these buildings to watch the sunset on every continent, not unlike the US, who have military bases on each continent. This tower, which I made in 2009, is carved out of a single block of Carrara marble. It's carved from both sides, from the outside, but also from the inside. It's over 30 feet in height, and the inside, almost 100 tons, was cut and removed only through its door. As a sculptor, I have always been interested also in entering the material, and so the sculpture becomes a habitat. For the Americas, I searched in different places, also like in Utah, 
but also in Peru, where I just came this morning, but uh, decided to get an island in Patagonia in Chile and named it Notona. The island and the views are so breathtaking that I s d decided not to build a house on top of this island. As I'm not an architect, I can also easily not build. So I was confronted with a new situation and decided to build a tunnel inside the island over 50 yards in length. You can see here the end of the house. This is a small window facing the west where you have spectacular views of the sun setting over glaciers. The island is formed out of white marble and the floor is one piece of marble 50 yards long. So this time I have been using the whole marble mountain to sculpt instead of a loose block of marble. The material was then removed from the tunnel, the which was removed from the tunnel. Uh, I used to build the stairs leading up to the island, as you can see here. And this is all what you can see at night of this big project that took six years to build in this majestic landscape. It's just this little light. It has been the longest and the most expensive uh, of all the projects. Two months ago, while I was in the Amazon, I found land south of the city of Manaus, where I want to build the same house I built in Agadez with the stairs, but this time out of wood. In the water in front of this land, you see sweet water dolphins. For Asia, I tried for a while to get a place in Yangtze in the southern part of China, but uh, due to complications obtaining the land, I gave up the project. But since this fall, I was given land, and this is for the first time that someone would give me land, uh, by a Shanghai collector in the north part of the city of Shanghai. Last uh, April, he had given a dinner in honor of the YAPA, which is the International Award for Public Art, which was held last year in, uh, at the University of Shanghai. And there were 141 projects worldwide were chosen by an international group applying architecture, sculpture, and social engagements, and these projects in Agadez were nominated and uh, given the award. And now this collector is happy to give me the land and to build it. Other land I found is on the island of Flores in Indonesia, where I'm gonna go next week. Here you can see a model of the house where sunsets will be able to see in over three volcanoes. Each one has, each of these volcanoes has a different lake and a different colored lake in it. Also, this one is 42 uh, feet high, and this building has 39 steps, like most of the buildings. And the stairs, this time, are built through the wall, so you can reach the terrace on either side of the building, from the inside and also from the outside. That means that local people can also use it, also when the house is closed. One project will be in New Zealand, and the exact place has to be decided also next week. But for Europe, it has been, of course, the most difficult to find a location due to complications and uh, or admi administrations and laws and prescriptions. But one option is in Sweden and hopefully a place in Scotland near Kildenan that a friend of mine, the, uh, the, the, the writer Andrew O'Hagan, has suggested. I haven't seen it yet, but from photographs and descriptions, it's, it, it, it's very promising. I learned during my projects in Africa that by involving local people in such challenges, you give them hope, strength, and trust. We need to understand that by helping Africa with, with uh, or other places for that matter in the world, with money donations alone is not working. It might, might, most organizations might help for a little while, but also add just to com corruption. But by being on site, and building and working and dreaming for and with them, using their own materials and giving them challenges, that's what makes the difference, I believe. And after all, it works in favor of both sides, even though it's as basic as just making a house to watch the sunset. A few years ago, uh, the city of Agadez was floated by heavy rains and some houses even collapsed. I was told that a few men protected the house towards the sunset with shovels and sandbags. And when asked why, they said, well, it's the best thing we have. That was a great compliment. Montaigne, he once said that to uh, live is uh, to learn to die. 
if our lives would last forever, there would be always new sunsets to, to, to watch. But as our days are counted, each sunset is special, and because it could be the, just the last one. Since uh, uh, there are three, eight brothers in my uh, African family, I built an octagonal shape house for them. Each brother has its own entrance to the room, and they can also meet in the central, uh, central courtyard. This is the tenth house. It's a house uh, about three hours south of uh, Agadez in the desert on a mountain, and it's called Tigedit. This house is carved out of the rock. It's, it's like a suit tailored for me. It has an entrance and an exit. I think it's enough to be called a house. I can sleep upright in this house. And there are, of course, more projects in, in the town which is in need of just about anything. You know, one project is to build a museum for dinosaurs, some species only found in the vicinity of south of Agadez, and kept at the paleontological department at the University of Chicago, and they wait for a place to return. Another place is, of course, a place to, to drink tea, as tea is very important to the Tuaregs and the Bororo. And then a play, another uh, project is to build a soccer play, place and, of course, other projects also. An important aspect of all these projects is the time is, most, is sometimes more, Im more important than money. Just about all these projects were conceptualized in a very short time. In Agadez, it took, so it took only one morning to ask, to find, to buy, to plan, and to start the project. It's interesting that Tuaregs, who spent four hours a day at least, just sitting, sipping tea, they say what fast is good. The project in Shanghai also just took a morning to look and find the right location to discuss and initiate the pro project. I, I like that. Of course, we might run into problems when speed is involved, but in our system of great prudence, we can also lose time, precious time, enough to succumb a project. For two years, I've been trying to build a new painting studio in Switzerland, and it, so far it took that all that time just to get a permit to build. If it takes any longer, I give up the project. Last uh, December, I was invited by a friend of, uh, uh, the owner of Listen Gallery in London, to visit the island of in Lamu in Kenya. He acquired some land in the nearby island of Manda, and he asked me to do a project. And this is the model of this project. Its height, of course, again, 21 feet. And this time, it's an interior staircase of 26 steps. There are three benches on top, uh, where you can see the sun setting over the African sky. And the material to build this would be coral bricks. Outside of my hometown in Saint in the, in the Engadin Valley, I've been working for the last 15 years uh, on a park with, which has three bridges. It has two towers, one with hair, and also a house which disappears in the ground by remote control. As I told you before, the Engadin attracts many people who build houses, of course, but these houses are empty for 50 weeks a year. And uh, the rest of the year, we have to look at these empty buildings. So the idea is to have your house disappear when you don't live in it.
you have any questions? Or Yes. 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 What kind of materials are you using to build in that location? Wood. How do you prevent the problem of the heavy rain season? Well, it's um, it's going to be in wood, and uh, well, we have to build um, a, a foundation, and the foundation is going to be uh, cement. Uh, usually, the houses have are on stilts, right? Uh, but this is not possible because it's too high to have. It. So it's going to be in uh, in cement. Do you know the area? I do. I know the area. Northern Alice is a tax shelter yes. for people in Brazil. Uh -huh. And when the city went into decline, the Brazilian government made it a tax shelter for businesses to go there. Yeah. So Suzuki, Honda have many of their manufacturing facilities in Manaus. It is in Amazonia where the Rio Negro and the Amazon rivers come together. It's famous because there is about 10 kilometers. Yes, they don't the mix. Do not blend. And it's so actually like inches. Dark and the other side is clear. Yeah, and the, fishes, what, the fishes are not able to go over to the other water. Yeah. They just uh, uh, swim in the same river. Right? How long is it taking you to build the project there? And did you get tired of trying to get authorization to build? In, uh, you mean in Brazil? <coughs> well, you know, like there are many places that I cannot buy land, but I, I, I do. Like in Indonesia, it's the same thing. A foreigner cannot buy land. So, but you have to trust people. Like um, uh, in Indonesia, on the island of Flores, um, I have this man which, which I trust. I, 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 he bought it, and it was a house on the land, and I gave him the house. So he, he could take this house because I'm going to make a new one. You just simply has to trust. I mean, uh, in uh, Manaus, the same thing. You know, uh, if you ask, start asking uh, lawyers, they will discourage you because they'll no, no, you know, it's not the right paper and so on. So I just give up. You know, like I don't have any time for that. I just like do it. Sometimes you might lose it, but like uh, you know, not everything has to be uh, uh, so settled. You know. And if the house, usually if you, if you buy land and, and you build a house, and the people start to like it, then it becomes legal. I even built illegal in Switzerland. All this park is done illegally. This house that you just saw is illegal. So like you can imagine, like in a country where like centimeters, it counts, like it goes down by centimeters. Uh, but uh, I could get away with it because it's a small village and I know the chief, whatever, right? Uh, uh, until some person who built his house maybe a meter too big in the woods, far away, uh, had to destroy it. And then this person, of course, got very angry. And so he said, but why do I have to destroy my house in the woods? And this guy can do whatever he wants. So like, of course, all the authorities, they came. And uh, it was ev everything was illegal. But at the end, they said, it's also bad. It's kind of sad that this guy has done this work for 15 years. And it was a very beautiful October day. And then they decided, well, we have to come up with something new. I mean, he would have to destroy everything after the law. So, like, but, um, so um, he came up with the idea of having a different zone, which is called a culture zone. It has never been done that before in Switzerland. And you know, in Switzerland, we vote by openly, right? And so like one evening, it was this meeting in this town where I live, and they were, my brother said, tonight they're voting on this issue, so you better go. So he was sitting in the front, I was sitting in the back, and there were 26 people, okay? So one person starts saying, well, you know, we have laws. And if, if everyone, if we, have, if we make exceptions, then these laws are, are worthless. So like to get 13 people on your side, it's very easy, okay? But then, of course, the mayor said, no, it's very important, you know, like it's a, the entrance of town, and then voting. And, of course, I, I was in the back, and my brother was in the front, and whoever votes against, you don't talk to this person anymore, right? <laughs> so, like, uh, but it was 26 against nothing. So sometimes, you know, it depends, like, uh, how the projects are, and, like, uh, and usually it just goes through. When did travel become uh, an important part of your of your job, and and why? What what made you realize that you needed to go around the world promoting, or not promoting, but building, uh, just 
providing people like the town in Niger, like with, you know, uh, a school, things like that? When did you decide that it was important to do that? Well, is it like, when did it become important to travel? Yeah, and when did that, uh, when I, did you I decide? Think I, I think I was uh, five years old, and I was going through town, through this village of Saint, and you had to say good morning or good afternoon to everyone. And, and since I have ADD, I uh, f- would forget, and you were punished. You know, like you had to write ten times, Bundi, Dona Manger, Bundi, Dona Manger, because you forgot to say hello to Dona Manger. Uh, and so, like, I thought, oh, it would be wonderful to go to a place where you don't have to say hello to everyone. So in Beijing, it's much easier. Uh, so, like, uh, but it's not, it's quite, uh, it's not atypical for people from my town to leave, because, like, also in the old days, they had to go and earn their money. So like, I mean, this is high up in the mountains. One person could take over the farm or the few business there are, and the other people had to leave. So like, if you are there, and like, I remember when I went to New York, and you're sitting with a farmer, and you and the farmer says, where do you live? And you said, I live in New York. He says, aha, uh-huh, yeah. But the same thing, the same time, when you go to Italy, and you're saying like, where do you live? And you would say like, I live in New York. It was like, wow, you live in New York. But for people there, it's fine to leave. We have to leave. It's just survival. So, uh, and once you, st- it's curiosity, I think. And uh, I'm actually kind of surprised that there are not so many people uh, traveling more. I mean, you know, traveling these days is not a big adventure. But usually, I think 90% or 95% go with tours or like, and they don't see much. But like, you go to this, for example, in, in Patagonia. This is one of the most spectacular places in the world. You're completely alone. I was there now for 10 days. I haven't seen anyone. I didn't see a horse. I didn't see a human. I didn't see money. I, say, I saw nothing. So like, I mean, it's amazing that you don't see more people, no? Are we, uh, w- would you also be interested in traveling, or why do you ask that? Why do I ask? No, I'm, I love traveling myself. Yeah, I'd like I'd like to travel just as much as you do at, yeah. at one part of my life. And it's m- it's very interesting to go in the third world. I think you know. I mean, uh, and uh, because there you still have this kind of adventure. And of course, when you travel, uh, one of the most basic things is to cover yourself so it's a habitat and so that's why this whole thing started and then of course you get involved you see the children like you have to you build a town uh, you build a school for them and um, and it's extremely awarding i must say you know uh it's so great to do that thank you I just wonder if you could say something about the town, in particular in Niger, uh, how all the buildings you put there have affected the social life of the town. I mean, the school is uh, kind of obvious, but like the, the cooling building and the sunset building, are, are they part of the, the routines of the whole town now? Well, it hasn't. It hasn't, of course. Like, I think, again, uh, uh, children are a little bit faster, so like, they want to go up there because it's, it's nice and, you know, uh, it's clean, kind of, and uh, yeah, even has toilets and stuff. Um, uh, but it, affects, it affected them. I mean, to see, like, at the beginning, it was, like, completely... They could not understand that this white man, because there are maybe seven white men in the town, uh, <laughs> Uh, that this would come and do something different. And like once it was a movie made and they asked one man, but why do you think this man, this white guy, is a bit different? And he said, well, strange, he walks like us, you know? Uh, So like I I think (coughs) you have, of course, first of all, uh, uh, to be on the same level, okay? And then, of course, you have to have also challenge. And um, and it works. I mean, it's also contagious. Uh, when you see something, they're, they're, they're fast, you know? If they see something like, wow, this really looks amazing. And they love it, you know? This idea that I said that when he was, when they, it's, they didn't try to save it. Um, and uh, yeah, also like, I see like how they're, they're, they're playing more detail, uh, uh, attention to detail, how, how they make, for example, the, the wall around their house or so. So it affects, like, yeah. What architects influenced your uh-huh. work and your designs? Yeah. And then also, where in New Zealand are you considering building? Uh, the museum, I mean, uh, this museum for, for, uh, for dinosaurs. What architects? Um, Buckminster Fuller is one. 
uh, I really like it. I, I also like that once he said that he is the world's most famous failure because he actually could do, do another architect. Well, kind of not an architect, but I, what I really like is uh, Simon Rodia that you have right here in, in Los Angeles. I, I think that's amazing that this man could do something like so amazing, like the Watchtowers. Uh, and when asked why, he, s he simply said, well, I just wanted to build something big. Uh, and when they asked, when actually, when they showed him a photograph of Gaudi, because he also used ceramics, the <laughs> he asked, but did Gaudi build that himself, or did he have workers? Because he built this all himself. I mean, that's amazing. I, I really like that. And uh, another person I really like is Gordon Matter Clark, the artist, the son of Chilean uh, painter, Mata, I, I really like that too. I mean, because it's kind of like he was a trained architect, but he, he, he made these interventions, like in New Jersey, where he, uh, uh, where he removed stones from the ground of a building that was supposed to, to, to be destroyed, and the house simply split in the, in the middle. I think that's that's great too. So uh, that's about it. I, I think, you know, I'm, I have like three people, three architects that work for me because like I don't know how to design things and all that. But um, basically, it has more to do with uh, sculpture than architecture. I think, or, uh, but it, you know, the gap between ar architecture and sculpture is clo is closing. If you see, like in Beijing, if you see the CCTV tower, it's amazing. It's not. It's not. A, it's a sculpture, uh, or like, uh, yeah. I mean, it's like today. It, it's it's meeting, right? It's but it's interesting that you, uh, usually the architects tend to go, of course, towards architecture. I mean, to, uh, towards uh, sculpture, and th there are not so many sculptors that go towards architecture. Uh, my neighbor in Beijing is Weiwei, Ai Weiwei, and he's also interested in that. So uh, it's kind of like we meet sometimes. Are you familiar with the work of the artist Nancy Holt? I know she's done a lot of public works installations. I'm sorry, I, I, I have my, my, my ears for some reason are, are, are like from flying. I cannot hear well. Can, can <laughs> no, no, it's fine. Do you know the artist Nancy Holt? I know she's done a lot of work with public installations, and she's said something similar to what you were saying earlier, which is it's much easier to get communities engaged in works that you're putting together if you can work with local materials and get um, people from the community to help build projects. Is that, uh, do you I, know I, anything I about think her? I think, uh, 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 where has she been? She's Wh done, she's where sh has she done in this country, or like has she done something in Morocco? She's done some things in Europe. She might have done some things in Morocco. I'm not sure. She's she's definitely worked, I think, in Norway and uh -huh. the United Kingdom, uh -huh. and she's done some work across the United States. Uh, she worked with Robert Smithson on some uh -huh. things previously because yeah. she, she was his wife before he yeah. died. I was just curious if yeah. If well, you and, and also the reason the reason things. why I decided because like you know when I was in Utah, Utah is amazing. I mean, like the landscape is so fantastic. You have like <laughs> thousands of places where you could build a house like that. But like uh, it has already been done somehow. I mean, uh, so much has been done in the sixties with land art and, and so on. So like I, I think uh, it was better to move uh, and to go to South America and like. Uh, and I'm really happy that this is in a very remote place. I think that's also important. Uh, uh, very few people will visit Agadez. Very few people will uh, see this project in in Patagonia. And very few people will ever go to to uh, Flores uh, or or to the Amazon, for that matter. Right? Uh, they might go maybe to Manaus and go and see the rivers meeting, but like really to go like f five hours south of Manaus. So I, th I think that's very important because uh, then it becomes kind of a myth, you know? I mean, <coughs> it's a little bit like just telling what it is. I mean, uh, I say like, if you say like, you have an island in, in, 
in Patagonia, it's like, wow, right? I mean, it's kind of like <laughs> already by, by the, the idea already kind of pictures uh, uh, this whole thing. Uh, and it's far, as far remote as better it is, I think, then it becomes a myth. <laughs> 